remember the day my dad came home uh, one day and he knelt down to my level and he says, Honey, uh, I've been asked to do a movie and we need a little girl. Uh, most of the adults, well, all the adults, as far as I know, pretty much just wanted to forget it ever happened. It's like, okay, we did this thing. I mean, like any production, you do something and it's a flop. Well, the last thing you want to do is keep hanging on to it. You just want to move on. And everybody did. But for me personally, it was really the best summer of my life. I thought it was gone. I had no idea that it was actually already out there and that small groups of people were were already watching it and already fans, even before Mystery Science Theater. I had no idea of this. I'm forgetting you. Remembering I together won't be again. All our time had a happy end. Oh, my name is Calvin McCarthy. Uh, we are here in beautiful Seattle, Washington at the Hilton for Crypticon Seattle 2015. We're going to be uh, screening our original short documentary, Manos, a conversation with Jackie Naiman. I feel like I'm nearly in a place. But you should never run away from us. Debbie, don't ever run away from us. No, our puppy. Where did you find the new dog, baby? In a big place. In a big place? Where, Debbie? There was a big, giant place. It was so dark, but I wasn't afraid of the dark. I had all kinds of funny people in it. Where is the place, Debbie? Over here, Daddy. What I remember is, you know, all this fanfare. It was such a big deal. Hal Warren had found a red carpet, and he borrowed some of those big sweeping lights from a local car dealership friend of his and so you know the lights are scanning the sky and all the the dignitaries of El Paso are there the mayor and the police chief and all these you know all the important people are there because at, up to this point they have convinced that as Hal's been telling them that this is the opening of uh, the the film industry for El Paso, Texas. <laughs> Later, as I grew up and my dad and I talked about it, he talked about how horrified he was. And he described it to me saying that he wished he was a snake and that he could just slither under the seats and drag his little snake family under the seats and out of the theater because there was no way, there's no way out. And we were trapped, we're in the middle of the row, plus if the star gets up and walks out, that's really bad. And so he felt our best, our best thing to do was just to sit it out, which we did, and then we escaped as quickly as possible. I just remember waiting anxiously to see myself on the screen and when my mouth opened and this voice came out of my mouth Mommy, I'm cold. I was just horrified nobody told me any of that well, we should have asked for better directions at the last gas station listen I've never gotten those lost before well how is out of money by that time for sure so he rented one limo and he had all of us cast and crew park, you know, a block or so away and wait uh, around the block. And I remember it being an alleyway. My dad says it was the lobby of the uh, hotel, but I, I don't, I'm not sure. Anyway, we waited and the limo would come around and pick up a few people and drive them around and drop them off in front of the theater with all the lights and everything. And, and Hal um, hired a couple of little street kids because we lived right on the border of Mexico. I mean, literally, you know, you're walking distance to the bridge to go across the Rio Grande de Juarez. And downtown El Paso is less than a mile from the bridge to get over the border, so there's a lot of street kids. And Hal had 
got some of these street kids, you know, the little kids that sell um, like chiclets, gum, and wash the windshields of your car. And there's a lot of kids like that in El Paso. So he got three or four of those kids and he handed them a little pad of paper and a pencil. And so you have all these uh, non-Hispanic people, not one Hispanic person in the whole film. And then you have these children that don't speak English um, eagerly handing, you know, you this pad of paper and, and, and little tiny pencils. He didn't even supply with pens. Uh. I'm forgetting you. Don't forget the silly way. Hal Warren was an insurance salesman. He was manager of an insurance agency. And Willem Brian Jennings was an attorney and he was also selling insurance on the side because he had to pay off the IRS. So he had a side job selling insurance. And so I think that's how he knew Hal. But Hal knew a lot of people. He was a real, uh, he was a real mover and shaker, you know yeah, what I mean? Be, he was a salesman, the eternal salesman. Yeah. And um, so he knew Judge Coldwell, who somehow he had seen the property. Honey, we'll leave in the morning, and soon this place will be forgotten. Forgotten? I'll never forget. Hal is not a, was not a warm, fuzzy kind of guy, <laughs> you know? Get in the bedroom and lock yourself in. I'm going to find Torgo. He's got some explaining to do. I mean, I was pretty much, I felt like a prop. You know, it's, I, I'm not, you know, he's just doing his thing. Where where's my puppy? Please, Debbie, not now. And he needed a kid, and, you know, I mean, you can tell, even at one point, what, he picks me up, carries me like a sack of potatoes, yeah, you know? Yeah. That's, and he pats me on the head another time, <laughs> like, that's what I was to him, you know? Okay, put her over right. here now. Okay, now pretend you're asleep. Pretend you're asleep again. I mean, even the characters. Now pretend you're too. asleep. Yeah. Okay, wake up. Pretend you're asleep. <laughs> when I felt like I wasn't speaking loud enough on my few lines, how would say, oh, that's okay, we'll fix it in the lab, and move on, and we just move on. And even as a child, I knew that things weren't quite going the way, you know, I know nothing about filmmaking. Peppy? You went away, baby. You went away while you were asleep. Mike, I want to leave this place now. Okay, honey, we'll leave right away. Where the hell is that caretaker? Targo! Targo! I am Torgo. I take care of the place while the master is away. But yeah, I, I remember John. He was, um, he was just such a sweet guy. He was really shy. He wasn't very tall. And, uh, you know, he's a method actor. So, like my dad said... Uh, he was mostly staying in character as much as possible, but I'm sure as this thing degraded and, and you know. The master wants you, but he can't have you. I want you. So he, he spent time with me, you know, when they were, other people were doing things out there in front of the house. There's a low rock wall there where the car first pulls up. And I remember sitting out there a lot and kind of just seeing what everybody was doing, just hanging out. The master doesn't like children. So, um, he would entertain me. He just, he was kind of, just, he was sweet, really sweet guy, just entertaining a little girl, being silly, you know, doing mm -hmm. magic tricks. Mm -hmm. I remember doing little, you know, which were pretty stunning to a small child, but they're probably just stupid little coin tricks and such, you mm -hmm. know. <laughs> You have failed us, Torgo. For this you must die. Fail you? No. You have failed yourselves. You never kill them. I'll help them. But, you know, my dad was a minister before he, he went to Texas Christian University to become a minister. And then he decided that the ministry wasn't for him. But he himself wrote the O Manos, God of Primal Darkness speech. 
and it sounds like a sermon because it kind of is. Thy priesthood remains steadfast, thy priesthood remains constant, thy priesthood remains righteous. My dad made all the props and right, the, painting. the painting and the master's robe. My mother sewed it, but they designed it together. And, and then my mom even made my dress. Oh, really? Well, she was a seamstress. She made all my clothes. And then she, do, she did the wives as well. Mm -hmm, and a weird aside, too, is that the wives all came from Mannequin Manor Modeling School in uh, El Paso, Texas. And when I was 13 and my mother had remarried for my 13th birthday, my father presented me with a certificate for um, classes at Mannequin Manor Modeling School. <laughs> I was pissed. I was not that kind of girl. I was a tomboy. I had I had my leather fringe jacket and I wore a headband. I was a little hippie girl and that was the last thing I wanted was <laughs> to be wearing white gloves and learning how to meet the Queen of England. Oh my God. I thought you said he was dead. Dead? No madam, not dead the way you know it. He is with us always. Like most people, I think, um, I first saw Mano on Mystery Science Theater 3000, um, and it was, uh, God, it had to be my junior year in high school, because it was the guy I was dating that introduced me to it, um, and his name was Joel, hilariously enough. To be completely honest, I've never watched it without the Mystery Science Theater going at the same time, because it's, it's just hard. You can't be the best, you know, <laughs> make the most of being part of the worst. Why don't you guys leave us alone? You know, Monos wouldn't exist if it weren't for them. So how can anybody get offended by that? Or hurt or, you know, I mean... <laughs> as far as you know, nobody nobody in the cast or crew or anyone that was affiliated ever had any sort of ill will towards... Well, most of them were dead by then, yeah. but... <laughs> But the truth is, I think Hal Warren would have been, I think he would have loved this. He would have been pretty thrilled. See, you're feeling better already. I and love the, the latest MST, the one, I don't know if you saw the one in theater, but, but it was like when they do that and I get up and walk out, it's like, Ed, I'm out of here, yeah, put out yeah. for a smoke or something yeah, like yeah. <laughs> It's really odd to me that, that it has, has blossomed into that, that kind of phenomena. I think it's really cool. No one could have predicted that. When people talk about, oh, this YouTube video is going to go viral, it's like you, could, you can't really predict those things. So 27 years goes by and then my dad just happened to see it on Mystery Science Theater because he was a, a big fan of Mystery Science Theater and so he was watching one Saturday afternoon. He was shocked. He was just shocked. And so was I when he called me and told me about it. So it's 27 years later, I mean, we never, ever, ever imagined that it would be back. I looked for it myself as an adult. I looked at, I mean, there was no internet. I never understood it myself, and my dad certainly doesn't understand it. Um, but the more I talk to people, I'm actually learning from other people what it is. And I recently have been connecting with Joel Hodson, and he, I think he said it best. He said that this film fills you with a sense of dread and that it's otherworldly and that there's just something about it that draws you in because it makes you so uncomfortable and it's so awkward. And then when you start learning more about it and how it came to be, you have this whole fan base that uh, filmmakers and film students and people realizing that what a feat it was in 1966 to not only make a movie, but get it into a theater. I mean, to do this whole thing on this tiny little minuscule budget in the middle of nowhere with a rented camera, there is no way out of here. It will be dark soon. There is no way out of here. 
I, I did not know when I came up with Manos the Hands of Felt, I had no idea that there was a huge cult following of Manos. I knew I knew MST3K was a thing, obviously, um, but but yeah, I didn't know that Manos had kind of become big. I, I didn't know until I was starting to write the script that there were other Manos plays, um, I, because I did, you know, I googled, I did Google research like, to make sure, one, that a Manos puppet musical had never been done before. Thank God it had. <laughs> Yeah, I should, I should show him if I'm going to talk about him. Um, but yeah, he, he's also a huge supporter of Manos and kind of loves the, the sort of Nordor... He'll, he'll dress up as the sheriff. But yeah, so this is what popped into my head, which is why Hands of Felt um, had to be made, because this guy started living in my brain and until I made him into puppet form. Had to get him out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don't do... Oh, it's just incredible. I feel like right now, I feel like I'm in a dream. It's just wonderful and amazing, and I kind of saw this coming, but I, now that it's really happening, it's, I do believe it. It's, I don't know, I feel like I won the lottery. I mean, it just must be what it feels like to win the lottery. I'm just so happy. So my life, to me, is so interesting that... Um, when you set aside the, you know, the financial issues of being self-employed in a creative manner, if you set that aside and just live in the present, the truth is I'm getting to live every dream I ever had in my life. It's amazing. And thou who dost curse with eternal burning light those who transgress against thee, Holy art thou, holy art thou, holy art thou, Manos will be done. <laughs> Manos, God of primal darkness, <laughs> 